the first three months of the war have seen a whole new way of waging war. In addition to the ever more effective weapons of war that now kill hundreds of thousands of men in mere weeks, airplanes fly the skies to spot for artillery, submarines prowl beneath the seas to sink sailors to watery graves, and cars and trucks transport men and equipment like never before. And just as all wars at some point become wars for vital resources, all of these new machines require a new one, and the Great War had now become a war for oil. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. When we left off, we saw the Germans and Russians fighting the colossal Battle of Ludge, which, though it did not result in German control of the city, did scuttle Russia's plans for an invasion of Silesia. With the end of the Battle of Ypres, the Western Front had congealed into a frozen stalemate, and in the Balkans, the Austrian army was pushing back the Serbs from the Kolubara River. Now, there were over 100,000 Austrian troops further north under siege by the Russians at the fortress of Przemysl. But there was still another Austrian army fighting in the field near Krakow. The Austrian army had retreated from the battles along the San River a couple of weeks ago after heavy losses. And though much of the army was holed up at Przemysl, they had a huge force at Krakow which the Russians, after cautiously advancing, had attacked on the 16th. Over the next 10 days, the Austrian army managed to stop the Russian juggernaut, but at the cost of 30,000 casualties. And by the 26th, they were forced to pull back. The Russians were now only eight miles from Krakow, the capital of Austrian Poland. But the Austrians were making headway in the Balkans, at least. Although they were suffering heavy casualties, they were pushing further and further into Serbia day after day. Actually, General Oskar Potiorek thought that the Serbs were trying to lure the Austrians deep into the country so they could be encircled, but he reasoned, correctly, that they were not in a position to do so. After three days of fighting, the Serbs were driven from Mount Malian the 24th, but Potiorek did not follow this up. His casualties had been too heavy, and the terrain had become too difficult for his exhausted troops, so the Serbs retreated unmolested. Potiorek was still convinced, though, that the fall of Serbia was only a few days away, and even appointed the country's future governor. But when his army attempted to cross the junction of the Kolubara and Sava rivers on November 26, the Serbs forced them back with 50% casualties, and the Austrian offensive ground to a halt. As we've seen month after month, the Austrian army has had its share of disaster in the field, but the troubles in the army were also internal. Chief of Staff Konrad von Hotzendorf was so worried about the national minorities of the Austro-Hungarian Empire attempting to seize power during moments of Austrian weakness during the war that he tried to impose military rule in Bohemia, Moravia, and Silesia. Emperor Franz Joseph rejected this plan. Konrad's worries did have some basis in reality, for Poles, Croats, Czechs, Slovaks, and other minorities were suspect in their sympathies, many of those minorities having a stronger affinity for the Russian enemy and occasionally even deserting and changing sides. One side note here, Jews were not considered suspect as many of the other minorities were and actually played a large part in Austrian military affairs. Three of the empire's field marshals were Jewish and eight of her generals. When you think about it, though unique in many other ways, this war was also unique that so many of the world's religions took part in it. This week saw the end of the Battle of Basra in what is now Iraq, where British and Indian troops defeated the Ottomans. There's a bunch of religions fighting right there. Now, two weeks ago, the British had landed troops and taken the fortress of Fao, the main Ottoman fortress on the coast of the Persian Gulf. See, when the Ottoman Empire had entered the war at the beginning of November, Britain had begun to worry about her oil facilities in the Persian Gulf. The capture of Fao was the first step in securing them. The London War Office actually favored simply defending British oil supplies and not engaging in offensive maneuvers. But the Indian government, who provided the troops, favored a policy of forward defense. You can guess what that means. Basra on the Shat al-Arab River was the next step in securing the oil. On the 19th of November, under General Sir Arthur Barrett, the British attacked, but heavy rainfall that turned the land to mud stalled the attack until the artillery could finally be brought up. The Ottoman army broke under the bombardment and fled the city, and Basra was occupied two days later. The campaign could easily have ended then. The oil supplies and oil flow were secure, but Basra turned out to be a pretty bad base of operations. It was a minor port, sure, but it was missing a lot of basic facilities like sanitation. There were no railways, there were few roads, and the water supply was just the dirty river. 
Now the river itself was a tidal river with many tributary creeks that filled a floodplain that actually flooded on a daily basis. And for half of the year, the entire region flooded, leaving Basra as an island. So Barrett decided to follow the retreating Ottomans upriver to Korna and try to make his base there, where the Tigris and Euphrates flow together to form the Shat al Arab. Of course, oil was not the only raw material in big demand this war. And I'm going to throw some quick statistics at you right now. If you look at the part of France occupied by the Germans, you see that Germany now held two thirds of France's iron production, a quarter of its steel, and a full half of the French coal mining capacity. Now these are big numbers when you think of the enormous amounts of machines that need to be built and operated. But fortunately, there was one machine that didn't run on oil and didn't require any coal, a horse. You needed a horse for almost everything in 1914, and there was no way you were going to get your heavy artillery into place without a great deal of horsepower. An estimated two million horses served on the Western Front on both sides during the war. And while I don't have numbers for all the armies, I do have some British numbers thanks to Max Hastings' book, Catastrophe. In the first 12 days of the war, the British Army bought 165,000 horses. The horses and mules of the British Expeditionary Force had an annual mortality rate of 29%, with 13,000 of them dead by the end of 1914. You'd think that since they were such a vital necessity, they'd be better treated in general, but such was not the case. There weren't enough knowledgeable riders and grooms, for one thing. Food and water was often neglected or withheld. Men galloped on paved roads, saddle sores were ignored, and heavy plow horses were conscripted into armies to pull heavy artillery, even though all the experts said it's a really bad idea. See, they required large amounts of provision, could not make forced marches, and were highly susceptible to disease. So they died by the thousands, and it was only trial and error by the British and French that finally discovered that American country horses from the plains and badlands of the Dakotas were far more suitable for war than any horses raised in barns. By the end of the war, the British Army had nearly half a million horses, and the Veterinary Corps personnel had grown from 360 to 28,000 four years later. So here we are near the end of November, exactly four months into the war. And at the end of the week, the Austrians are stuck in Serbia, surrounded in Przemysl and in trouble at Krakow. The British are on the move into Mesopotamia and in Belgium, France, Poland, and Eastern Turkey, everyone on both sides is frozen and miserable. Valentine Fleming, MP and father of James Bond creator Ian Fleming wrote, quote, it's going to be a long war in spite of the fact that on both sides, every single man wants it stopped at once." End quote. This was absolutely true, from the generals on down. There was no end in sight. There was no relief in sight. And the men on the Western Front, who had a week relatively free of constant bombardment and furious rushes across no man's land, considered themselves lucky. The only way to win this war was to seek new technological advantages, and one of the requirements for them was oil. Both sides now found themselves in a struggle for oil that would last for four years and kill thousands upon thousands of young men. Many of these young men lived their final days in a vast network of trenches. From their early improvised days, it didn't take long until these trenches were a parallel world with structures that would go way beyond their initial purpose of mere protection from enemy bullets. If you want to find out more about the trench system, check out our special episode on trenches right here. And let us know in the comments what other topics you'd like to see in future special episodes. See you next week.